Hello and welcome to the Beyond IoT 4.0 workshop 8.2. I'm Manuel Caballero of Nimbo Research Center at NTU, and I will be moderating this workshop. The title of this workshop is Hardware Innovation Delivered. We have three wonderful speakers today with us who will tell us all the info we need regarding this topic. The format of this workshop will be a slide show followed by Q&A season. Please take part throughout the workshop by tapping your questions into the chat area. The speakers will answer the question at the end of the workshop. Please note that this workshop will be recorded. And now, I think we are ready for the rock and roll. I'm pleased to welcome our next speaker, who is myself. So, who is myself and I'm here. Sure. There you go. And this hardware innovation delivered is a topic. And this presentation is meant to show the main issues and the ways to solve them uh, when it comes to hardware projects. And let me introduce myself. I'm Manuel Caballero, senior researcher at Nimbus Center. My skills are hardware and firmware design mostly, although I'm moving into microelectronics design and application of micro nanoscale system. Uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna be totally honest with you. I want to go straight to the point. So, when is a project successful? I would say, according to my experience, to my experience, when a project provides margin. In other words, when the budget covers the whole project, when it mitigates risk from defect, and finally, it satisfies the customer. And that sounds terrific, right? But very generic. So let's go a bit in depth. So. When do things go wrong? And I think guys, this is the heart of the matter. And things go wrong when poor interaction between electrical design and mechanical design. Sometimes the communication between the teams in a company and the client aren't fluent. Poor understanding of supplier limitation. This is very important. This is related to the previous one kind of. And let me give you an example. And the client sometimes considers that the smaller the device to be designed is, the better. But that's not true. In fact, in most of the cases, that's totally false. As an example, I'm gonna continue with this example. If the device to design is small, that means that the printer circuit, the printer circuit board, the PCB itself, must be small too. Therefore, the hardware design will be more complex, increasing the total cost of the project at the end. And on the other side, the smaller components may not be in stock. So that may delay the deliverable of the project. And when life was different without lockdowns, restrictions because of a virus, I don't know if you remember the life, I miss it. And people could meet. I remember on one of the conferences I attended, uh, I speaker said the following sentence. There can be many things that you don't know, you don't know. And believe it or not, that sentence was like a revelation. That sentence makes a lot of sense to me for both client who has the idea and company that has to implement that idea. That's why a very good understanding of what it is going to be designed is mandatory to minimize the unpredictable and unknown things that may arise during the project. And before I leave the bad things, uh, what it may go wrong in a project, let me show a graph that summarizes what we have seen so far. By the way, I didn't uh, make this graph. This graph I got it from the DFR solution in a workshop I attended. And it makes a lot of sense. It shows the cost in terms of reliability. Generally speaking, if we split the project into four phases, concept, design, validation, and production, we have the following. Uh, on the concept phase is the idea itself. The reliability is not that important in this phase. Here, the communication between the client and the company is the key. Now, on the design phase, if something goes wrong, the cost increases because there are tasks that have to be redone again. And then we have validation and production where the cost of unreliability is huge. Why? Well, basically, because some tasks have have to be made from scratch. And the customers of the client 
may end up losing faith on the product. So what can we do then? So that's the magical question. What, what can we do? Companies like us, like Nimbus. As I said previously, a good communication between the client and the company is the key. And guys, I'm not going to get tired of repeating this sentence, this mantra, the communication is the key. On the, on the other hand, on the company side, the deliverable has to be optimized in terms of the initial funding. Then, well, you can say, you can think, Manuel, it is just a matter of money at the end. The answer is no, the funding is important, but a good organization is mandatory. That's why at Nimbus, we pay a lot of attention to this subject. We, let's say, compact the idea and expectation of the client with the initial funding using the technology readiness levels, TRL. Therefore, depending on the idea of the client and the sort of funding, we find the optimus TRL for the project and what has to be delivered. Finally, as a conclusion, our weapons here at Nimbus to deliver a successful project are, well, we make use, we try to make use of industry standards where it's possible, no matter if it's for hardware design or firmware design. Then we pay attention to those little details like a mechanical, aesthetics, and thermal as just as important as electrical. Something very important, design rules are a good start, but not the way to win. The way to win is the communication. I repeat myself here again, the communication between all the teams in the company and the client. And finally, assure that critical obje objectives, of course, quality, reliability, safety, time to market, and customer satisfaction are known, balanced, monitored, and achieved with core funding. That's why here at Nimbus, we take care of the whole process from the idea to the final product. And that's pretty much what I had to say. So thank you for watching. Don't leave because we have now our next speakers. They are wonderful presentation. If you want to contact me, you have the, my email here, okay? Manuel.caballerohat, C-I-T, I. -E. Now we're gonna move on to our next speaker, who is Mr. Nikolaos Chalikias. Nikos, how are you doing? I'm good. So let me introduce you to the audience. So Mr. Nicolás Chalikias for the last 30 years has developed an embedded system on telecom, industrial and wireless sensor involved on proposals and full development life cycle from board to system level, procurement, production and testing. Here at Nimbus in MTU, he's leading the development of embedded system and end-to-end -end IoT projects. He's the leader of NBlocks which is a modular embedded system platform and the M-Block Studio. Uh, is that correct, Nico? Did I miss something? Yes, it is correct. Okay, so I'm gonna share your screen now. Let me, your presentation. Give me one second. There you go. Okay, so when you're ready. I'm ready. Or yours. Okay, this is about M-Blocks and M-Block Studio. Uh, next, please, Manuel. Um, NBlox is a modular embedded system platform, and NBlox Studio is a low code, model based design tool. Uh, I'm Nicola Schalikas, uh, and I work at, at Nimbus Center as a researcher. So, uh, let's start. What is NBlox? NBlox is a modular, low power embedded system platform based on standardized pinout and form factor. Mblox adopts a plug and play concept where computing, sensor power, and communication boards can be plugged together to achieve a particular embedded system, architecture, and capabilities. Uh, some metrics. We have 60 different Mblox 24 pins, 16 different Mblox Pro, seven years in 35 projects, 40% less development type, uh, 125 firmware libraries, 40 wiki articles and three publications. 
sample of some projects we have used uh, M blocks. M blocks have been used in many projects for European Union, industry, agriculture, lab automation, water management, and more. Uh, in this uh, slide, we have uh, FATS oils and greases monitor, uh, wireless building management, river environmental. What's happening here? Monitor. Uh, no, you know, I'm the previous one, yeah. Um, Cutting tissues injector and uh, lab rig controller. Okay, ready for the five. Manuel, you have to, to, to pause it because it, it uh, runs by itself automatically. Yeah, yeah, there, there. Okay. The Mblox platform is built with the following principles in mind. Modularity, boards that can be plugged together like bricks to create wireless nodes or controllers with varying capabilities. Also functional scalability. The boards have 240 pins to expose as many functions as possible and create a non-limited scalable platform. The processing, the processing uh, performance scalability, a large range of ARM Cortex microcontrollers, support a wide range of software applications starting from battery powered wireless sensors to Linux on the edge. Ultra low power operation supports unattended and battery operated IoT devices. Ready for the six. Modularity, host and peripheral boards plug together to implement the use case. No cables needed. Many IoT use cases can be delivered by plugging just two boards. The host and blocks do have a microcontroller and they all share a 240 pins uh, pin out in four low profile connectors. Uh, ultra low power and wireless is supported Peripheral boards, no microcontroller here, can be ultra low power sensing, application specific motherboards, displays, actuators, motor control, and many more. The development boards support uh, pitch breakout and prototyping, embed enable and debugging, and ultra low power. Uh, ready for the seven. Uh, the half size and blocks pro support sensor expansion, our Cortex M0, and the 12 pin adapter for rapid prototyping on simple and low pin count uh, use cases. Ready for the next. This is an example of a future rich uh, ultra low power battery operated LoRa 1 sensor. Three boards and a battery, and a battery holder and an enclosure are integrated without cables or soldering. This example is a wireless battery operated LoRa1 indoors environmental sensor reporting to the cloud. Um, yeah, we don't need more details. I'm ready for the next. Uh, this is another example for a motion controller that can be used on 3D printers, CNCs, and robots. Here is controlling an experimental mega delta motion system for 3D printing and pick and place applications. The red component is an ARM Cortex M3 and blocks Pro host driving the system. And the motherboard is an application specific and blocks Pro peripheral. Uh, ready for the next. Okay, uh, one more example on using end blocks. This is a motherboard for lab automation projects with, um, with a 24 pin series. Uh, the white peripheral boards can be controlled by a serial channel like a square C, SPI, or UART from the microcontroller and block. And the distributed functionality of the white boards cover thermistor sensors, load cell interface, DC motor control, Power PWM, digital inputs, analog inputs, proximity, and Modbus. 
ready for 11. One more example, we are using a development support and block, uh, which provides embed enable and debugging interface over serial and serial over USB. This development board can be sandwiched between two other boards to provide debugging support while this is needed. And then it can be removed. So the debugging capability is not an overhead for the final use case. Okay, for 12, please. Now about the studio. Uh, an introduction, Mblock Studio is a development tool to produce embedded software using the flow-based approach. It's mainly focused on developing firmware to run in the microprocessor part and blocks, enabling fast, intuitive application development for the Internet of Things. It was developed having in mind the compatibility with other scenarios as well, becoming a general purpose embedded firmware development tool. Due to the flow-based strategy, users can develop a full working application without code, as a large part of the writing effort is replaced by graphical connections. Mblock Studio features a graphical diagrammatic programming environment for application development. Its aim is to allow users to develop applications without writing code. It uses the flow-based design paradigm where function blocks are connected with wires. About the code, the Engblock Studio generated code runs in a soft real-time firmware system. Uh, there is an underlying kernel and event-driven tasks. And finally, about the server, the Engblock Studio public server manages nodes written by the Engblock Studio team, as well as by the users. Um, okay, ready for the next. Uh, then Block Studio concepts. The node is the basic building element of a design. The nodes are event driven and create outputs in a timely manner driven by the periodic uh, kernel operation. The nodes inputs in a graphical environment are on the left side of, of the nodes and the outputs on the right side. Then we have the flow, which is a single set of connected nodes, like, like this one. Connections connect the nodes and represent how events flow through the nodes. Uh, in graphical environment appears wires, like, like this one. Design is the total of the nodes used to implement a working system. Translation is the process of the automatic code generation from the design files. And compilation is the process of using a C++ compiler to create an executable binary file for uh, our target board. Uh, ready for the next. OK, the workflow. First, uh, we select the nodes we need for our design. Then we create the design by placing all the nodes on the canvas, connecting them with wires, and configuring all the nodes parameters. Then we export. Third, we call the Block Studio Translator, and the C++ project folder tree is created and populated with the libraries and the auto-generated code. This code is the code for our design. Fourth, we compile with our normal ARM compiler, and we have an executable uh, uh, file for uh, our board. And fifth, we flash that program to our microcontroller, and we have a running system. Uh, Fifteen, please. And Block Studio supports multi-board design. That is the creation of the firmware of all different boards of a system in a single design schematic. In this example, we have both the transmitter and the receiver for a LoRa radio testing setup. 
16 players. Then block studio kernel is a low footprint, soft real-time kernel with low dependencies, manages the flow-based timely execution of nodes code. The nodes code execution and the messages, uh, the flow of the messages are both controlled by the kernel. Uh, 17, please. The server. Then block studio server runs on a public hosting uh, service. Uh, the users are registered, can contribute with nodes definitions and code, and use existing nodes created by other users. In this example, we have a user named A who has contributed 12 nodes and is using 36 from the 60 available in the server. Uh, ready for the next? Okay, where, where do we save? Where, 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 where is the code of the, for every node? Each node code is maintained in its own remote Git repository, supporting autonomous node evolution and documentation. Maintenance of legacy programs that are using past versions of the node code. Uh, privacy, if needed for IP protection, the Git repository can be hosted securely in the cloud or even in on-premises uh, Git server. Uh, 19, please. About the hardware uh, abstraction layer. Uh, the hardware related nodes code is using the ARM supported embed hardware abstraction layer. The embed hub allows faster node code development with well supported variety of features for a large range for a large range of ARM microcontrollers. Uh, the Mblock Studio is tested with Mblocks and third party uh, boards. We also support the support of Arduino hardware. Arduino hardware abstraction is a new feature in testing status. With Arduino support, newly support, newly developed nodes can access use cases not covered by embed. Uh, the Arduino compatible Mblock Studio kernel nodes are tested with a standard 8 bit Arduino on the board. Next, please. So, working with Mblock Studio only slightly affects the project file tree structure we normally use, adds a high level design element, dramatically reduces manually created code reduces development time, and facilitates library and IP maintenance. And next one, I'm finished. Okay, thank you, Nikos, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Now we're gonna move on, we're gonna, with our next, Speaker is Miss Mary Cassie. How are you doing, Mary? Hi. Yes, I'm here. Hi. Well, you're fine. So let me introduce yourself to the uh, to the audience. So she has a master in public health, high diploma in occupational health and safety, and a bachelor of science in degree degree in industrial pro, uh, production and design. Am I correct? That's right. Okay. So give me one second to. Show your slide. So, let me go here. So, once you're ready. Yeah, that's fine. Go to it. Can I go ahead? Yeah, you can go ahead. Sorry. Okay. So, just the name of it's it's quite a different <laughs> um, slide showing up from the last one. But uh, mine is just all, it's a medical device. So the name of the project is called Easy Vein. So um, we just go on to the next slide, Manuel. Okay, would I want to, would I click on to it or? I'm, I'm on, on slide number two right now. Yeah.
Are you on slide number two? I can't see you moving them. You cannot see it? Which slide number two? Which slide do you want me to? to... Just, yeah, just going to slide two. You're in it, is it? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, sorry. No, it's just not showing up. It's only showing up the first slide. Sorry. That's fine. And um, so Easy Vein intends to improve the visualization of a vein for a clinician. And it's creating a faster, more efficient way to carry out IV cannulation or just the regular blood test. I set up the company MCAS Design Limited in 2019, and I'm the CEO and the founder. And this project started um, in the Ignite program in UCC, which is a 12 month program. And I also did the NDRC in Dublin. So this really gave me a great foundation um, for this project. So we might just click on to the next one. Yeah. yeah. So uh, globally, um, the um, IV therapy market is worth 54 million. And over 1 billion people get their bloods taken annually. 90% of people who enter hospitals require a blood test for diagnosis and treatment. However, for 35% of these patients, they will suffer from DVA, that's difficult vein access. And this in turn can lead to significant costs in hospitals and um, creating poorer patient outcomes. So I'm just going to talk about the problem now. Okay. Okay. So are you on slide number four? Number four, yes. Yeah, because no, because I can't see. I just see the first one again. Anyway, IV calculation and blood tests can become a very time consuming uh, procedure when things go wrong or even when dealing with a uh, nervous patient. It can be frustrating for the clinician and stressful for both the clinician and the patient. So it can be a very painful procedure. And, you know, sometimes you've got insufficient samples um, received. And plus the clinician can suffer from um, needle stick injuries. And you can also have a lot of um, indirect and hidden costs even due to wastage um, from um, um, materials used for each procedure, or each failed procedure. So um, basically it, it can be a very frustrating um, um, for, and costly procedure. So we'll just go on to the next one. Okay. So um, the vein illumination market is worth $95 million. And there's a variety of vein detection devices out there in the market ranging from 350 euros to 6,000. All vein detection devices need to be either plugged in, recharged, sterilized in between patients and uh, incur major you know, maintenance costs in hospitals. And so this, hospitals tend to buy only three to four of these due to the above reasons. And usually junior clinicians carry out this procedure as it is such a used procedure prior to any other um, main procedures being carried out that day. And B, then have to aid them to be more successful on their first and second attempt. And this is all what they're allowed before they have to call for a senior person. They didn't have to wait for a more senior clinician to arrive. And for some reason, these are the only people who have the vein detection devices. So this is then when the costs start to escalate. You're paying for a senior person, you know, more wastage, time wastage, delay in diagnosis, and it can eventually lead on to legal costs. So we just go on there to the value proposition slide. Yeah. So can you... Um, So mainly it is just to, I can't see the slides, sorry, no. We are on this last slide. Yeah. But, um, so just there, basically, um, that's the, so what I'm basically doing is replacing, making, um, um, I can't see there, I'm just going to ask, you're replacing, you're creating uh, something that's readily available for the clinician, okay? And therefore you can, you're reducing the times from, uh, 22 minutes to 8.5, which is the normal procedure to take bloods. And reducing the cost, we'd say from 44 euros plus to less than five euros. So this is primarily going to be a um, mass produced item that's low cost and that can be readily available in any part of the hospitals. So my competitive advantage here, so it's, um, it's 
we go on to the next slide there, if you don't mind. Thanks, Sam, by the way. So it's, um, it's a single-use disposable um, unit, okay? You can click into all of them there, please. And this is particularly helpful when dealing with COVID patients where infection control procedures are making it difficult to move something from one room to another. So making it a low cost item that's easy to dispose of will benefit the patient and make life easier for the clinician. So you, it's a single use disposable unit, as I said, there's no sterilization in between patients. And you, know, you don't need two members of staff you just need one. Normally what's happening is one person will have to hold the vein detection device while the other person, it carries out the procedure. This will eliminate all this complex complexity. And um, so it's, um, it's just to kind of speed on the procedure going from one to the other. And that's basically um, the competitive advantage of this. So basically, oh yeah, thank you. I can see them at last. <laughs> So, and there's no power supply needed in this. You don't have to worry about where you can plug in the item. If it's, you don't have to worry about recharging it and it um, can be transferred anywhere. And it's ideal, we'd say in an ambulance scenario where paramedics, they don't have any vein detection devices. They have nothing to prep the patient prior to arriving to A&E. And so these would be found in, you could have packed some five to 10 in an IV tray ready to take out, ready to use, and you don't have to worry about who can I contact, where can I find one in the hospital? So, okay. So we'll just go on to the next slide, the uh, marketing opportunity. Yep. Keep going on there. So just, um, yeah, you can keep clicking on, the rest of it will uh, come up the, okay. Yeah, perfect. That's great, thank you. So um, talking about this, um, the vein um, illumination market is worth 9.2 uh, billion, okay, uh, sorry, the vein access uh, device market globally. And in Europe it's worth 2.5 billion. And the, the sum is 177 million, that's including Ireland and the UK population based. So I am, um, so, it has quite a, a large um, market opportunity here. And the main leaders we say would be in IV therapy are um, Braun, Bexter, Becton Dickinson and Medtronic. So we might just go on to the last slide. This is quite a sharp presentation. So basically it's team. Team I suppose is very important and I'm still building this. Um, I am completely in control of the whole project as such still. And um, the engineers from Nimbus, I suppose they have a variety of backgrounds and uh, they have worked in medical device projects previously. And I also am getting help from ASSERT and these, this um, ASSERT is in UCC, it's the College of Medicine and Health. And they have, um, here they have training, research, innovation, all closely interlinked. And it's dedicated to improving patient outcome. I'm also currently getting a market um, validation report done by Armac, and this is um, a good foundation to see the opportunities here and where it will be, you know, more suitable. Will it be IV cannulation or will the market be in uh, blood taste, you know, blood taking? And uh, so this will be finished at the end of uh, January. And I also have, um, um, I'm also engaging with a clinic and working very closely with them. So we have our regular meetings with Nimbus and, you know, I'm working then with this clinic and so hopefully um, shortly we'll be able to engage with them. And uh, it's so important, you know, for preclinical trialing, it's such a long road ahead to get this hopefully potentially out onto market. And it's, you really have to worry so much, uh, or you have to work so closely with your end user. And so this is um, a learning process as well. And um, so, that's basically um, um, my project, and so that's it. So, if you have any questions, um, far away. So, uh, thank you, Mary, for your for your for your presentation. Sorry for the technical issue. I think we couldn't. Uh,
wasn't, it's okay. wasn't sharing the presentation or sharing the, the slides. So I managed to do it at the end. Thank you very much. We have now the, the Q&A. So if someone has a question to ask for any of the speakers, so they can, they can answer the question. You can use the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Otherwise, no questions. Okay, so if there's no question anyway, thank you. Uh, sorry. Thank you for coming. Uh, it was a pleasure. First of all, I want to thank all the, all the speakers and all our contributors. Uh, thank you for watching and uh, we'll see you next time. Okay, thank you. That's great. Thank you.